Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Matthews. I'm here to talk to you today about bioenergetics. So bioenergetics is essentially how the body uses foodstuffs in order to make energy for the body to use. All right, so um, the uh, term that a lot of people use for this is metabolism, but metabolism is actually the sum of all chemical reactions in the body. So this can be both anabolic chemical reactions and catabolic. Anabolic meanings to, meaning to build something, catabolic meaning to break down that something. Right, so most chemical reactions in the body require an enzyme in order to make them actually occur. So an enzyme is essentially what we have up here. Uh, this is an example. So an enzyme is something that's going to lower the, uh, the energy required to make a process initiate. All right, so there's always a little bit of energy that is required in order to make a process, a chemical reaction take place. All right, so what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to allow this substrate to bind to it um, and it's going to bind in this active site here. Notice how they're essentially the same shape. So this functions like a, essentially a, a locking key. Okay, so if it doesn't fit together, then they're not going to work together. All right, so when they come together, this is called the enzyme substrate complex. If you think, just as an analogy here about enzymes, basically what you have is this, this reaction in the body that wants to take place in, with what we're talking about today with bioenergetics, it's hopefully going to end with ATP, which is the energy molecule that the body uses. All right, so uh, if you look at our little analogy, though, we have this person, they want to get past this wall and down to the, say, this the ocean in order to catch fish to eat in order to survive. All right, so they can either go above the wall, which is going to take a lot of energy, or if they have the right key for the door, so essentially the right enzyme and uh, substrate, they can go right through the door and go down to the ocean in order to catch fish and do whatever, and it lowers the energy required. All right, so if we look here at um, essentially what's going on, again, we have this activation energy that has to be put into the system. If there's no enzyme present, that activation, activation energy is going to be very high, so it's a lot of loss energy. If there is a, an enzyme present, the activation, activation energy is much lower, and so the loss energy is much less. All right, and so down here, this energy that is gained from the system, this blue here, um, if, when the substrate is broken down, is going to be the same either way. All right? The difference, though, is the net energy, so the energy put in versus the energy taken out, is going to be smaller when there's not an enzyme there to catalyze the reaction than it is when there's an enzyme there to catalyze the reaction. Because, again, the difference is the energy that is used for activation is lower when there's an enzyme present. All right, so when you're looking at this uh, kind of stuff, you're looking at textbooks or whatever, uh, most of the time if you see something that ends in ASE, that's an enzyme. So if it ends in ACE, essentially, that's an enzyme. All right, so enzymes are going to be important, again, for most reactions that take place. Uh, they are both temperature and pH sensitive. So typically, if the, the body temperature goes up, enzyme activity is also going to go up. So that's good with exercise because when we exercise, our body temperature goes up. Unfortunately, for a lot of enzymes, not all, but for a lot of enzy enzymes, when the um, pH goes down, so in other words, it's getting more acidic, this is going to reduce the enzyme activity. All right, so um, that is also something that happens with exercise. So when we exercise, we heat up, making the enzymes a little bit more effective, but we also become more acidic if it's high-intensity exercise, making the enzymes a little less effective. So it's going to sort of feed back on us to slow us down a little bit. All right, so again, though, the, the enzyme is this lock and key mechanism. So if this lock and key in somehow gets distorted or uh, the shape changes, so it's a conformational change to the shape, then the enzyme isn't going to work properly. And that's essentially what happens when the, it gets too hot or the pH um, gets too low. All right, the enzyme actually changes shape, so it's a conformational change in that shape, and so the enzyme in the substrate no longer fit together properly. We're gonna go over a handful of slides here that are basically um, just definitions, but they're really important definitions that you have to have in the back of your head when going over this information. So ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, 
phosphate is the basic unit of energy the body uses. All right, so um, everything the body does, uh, any sort of physical activity, exercise, sports, whatever it is you're doing, uh, walking up the steps, uh, your body's using ATP. So everything that the body is doing as far as bioenergetics is therefore um, trying to make ATP. ADP, so adenosine diphosphate, so the two phosphates instead of three, um, can be phosphorylated into ATP. So that's called ADP phosphorylation. Um, so again, that's the process of making ATP from an ADP in an inorganic phosphate, and in the process, adds, adding a little energy to that bond so that it can be broken later and used for some sort of movement or something. So the body also has these electron carrier molecules that are used to also make ATP when we get to talking about um, the electron transport chain, you'll see when they come in. All right, so the two that we have are the nicotinamide aden adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, which is turned into NADH, which is the high energy version of that, and flavin adenine dinucleotide, or FAD, which is turned into FAD. To uh, FADH2, which is the high energy version of FAD. All right, so both of these are going to eventually uh, be produced through different processes that we're talk er, we're going to talk about here. They're going to go to the electron transport chain, which we're also going to talk about here, and they're going to be eventually used to make ATP. All right, so from one NADH molecule, you can get about two and a half ATP molecules, and from one FADH2 molecule, you can get about one and a half ATP molecules again using aerobic metabolism in the electron transport chain. All right, so it's important for us to talk about how we know um, how much energy is in some sort of food stuff. All right, so we're going to be talking about carbohydrates, fats, proteins, those sorts of things uh, here and now. All right, so but in order for us to know this, somebody had to do the research in order to figure it out. All right, so what they use in order to do this is something called a bomb calorimeter. So all food that contains energy does have the ability to burn. All right, so essentially we burn it in this bomb calorimeter that's surrounded by this water bath here and that water bath is going to increase in temperature and that increase in temperature is measured with some sort of thermometer and that is how we calculate the calories of a certain food. All right, so essentially one calorie is the amount of heat required in order to raise one gram of water from 14.5 Celsius to 15.5 Celsius. So again, all a calorie is is how much energy it takes to increase the temperature of water a certain amount. One thing that's a little bit of a misnomer is on, in, at least in the United States, a dietary label is going to uh, count calories. All right, but those calories are not actual calories, they are kilocalories. So if you go to most other countries, it's not gonna say calorie, it's gonna say kilocalorie. All right, so in the United States, one dietary label calorie is actually equal to one kilocalorie, which is essentially a thousand calories. All right, so um, again, if you are looking at the calories on a dietary label, um, it's not like you're suddenly eating a thousand times the number of calories that you uh, had originally thought. It's just your units were a little off. And again, that's for whatever reason, that's what the United States does. 1,000 calories equals one kilocalorie, which is one dietary label calorie in the United States. All right, so again, all this is figured out using a bomb calorimeter. If we are looking at carbohydrates, so carbohydrates are, have um, carbon and hydrogen and uh, they can be broken down in order to produce energy all right, by, by our bodies. So 4.1 kcals of energy per gram of carbohydrates is what our body can get out of those carbohydrates. All right, so the main carbohydrate that our body uses and that we need to talk about here is glucose. All right, so glucose is a monosaccharide, so it's a single saccharide uh, carbohydrate, and it is what our body primarily uses for energy. This is also whenever you hear somebody talking about blood sugar, they're actually talking about blood glucose levels. All right, so it's the amount of glucose that's in our blood at any point in time. All right, so glucose is broken down by a process called glycolysis. 
So glycolysis is how we break down glucose in order to make ATP or energy. One thing that's important to note about uh, glucose is it is the only food source that our brain and spinal cords, our central nervous system, can use for energy. So it can't use fat, can't use protein, has to use glucose. All right, so that's one reason why if somebody goes on some sort of uh, low-carb diet, they're usually a little groggy and maybe cranky for the first few days until their body adjusts and starts to produce its own glucose. Glucose uh, can be stored for later use. The, the, the substance that is created is called glycogen. So glycogen is the storage version of glucose. So essentially it is a bunch of glucose molecules stuffed and packed together. All right, so we primarily store glucose in the liver and in the muscle, so the skeletal muscle. The process of making this glycogen from glucose is called glycogen glycogenesis. So um, this is something that uh, our body is always trying to do and always trying to top off the glycogen stores, and it's really good for athletic performance to have a lot of glycogen stored. The process of breaking down the glycogen in order to then use that glucose and so basically to liberate the glucose from the glycogen in order to use it for athletics or exercise or whatever is called glycogenolysis. All right, so glycogen and then lysis, lysis meaning to break down. We build up glycogen stores, we, so we turn glucose into its storage form of glycogen through glycogenesis, and then we break down that glycogen using glycogenolysis in order to get the glucose back in order to use it to produce ATP or energy. All right, so our bodies can also use fat as an energy source. So fat has a lot more energy in it per gram, which is the reason why a lot of people are sort of scared of fats, even though that's something that is uh, now be becoming debunked within uh, the nutrition literature that's out there. Uh, but anyways, um, so fats have 9.4 kcals per gram, where if we go back, carbohydrates only had 4.1 kcals per gram. Um, you're also going to see in a minute that protein has the same amount of, of kcals as carbohydrates. So fats has, again, a lot more energy per unit than the other two uh, energy substrates that our body likes to use. The process of creating fats in the body, so storing it, is called lipogenesis. All right, so we're going to create fat, we're going to put it into our adipose tissue, and that is essentially our body's way of storing energy for a later date. All right, so if you eat too much of anything, whether it's carbohydrates, protein, or fats, it's going to get stored in the body through lipogenesis, and it's going to be essentially there so that we can utilize it at another date. So fat's a good thing as long as you don't have too much because it gives, it gives you energy um, whenever energy is not around. The storage form of uh, fat is triglycerides. All right, so when we go through lipogenesis, we create triglycerides. Um, and this can be stored in adipose tissue all around the body, inside the muscle itself, so between the muscle fibers, uh, subcutaneously, which is the fat that a lot of us sort of think about and don't really like because it's the fat right underneath the skin. Also, deep down into the um, abdominal cavity, between organs, there's also a fat cushion. These triglycerides can be broken down um, to through lipolysis in order to be used eventually to create ATP, again, our energy. All right, so when lipolysis occurs and we're breaking down triglycerides, we are liberating fatty acids. We're also liberating uh, glycerols, but we're not going to talk about that quite as much. All right, so we're liberating these fatty acids, um, so it's essentially the single unit of fat um, that can be used in order to make energy. All right, so this is eventually going to go into a process called beta oxidation in order to create something called acetyl-CoA that we'll talk about um, later on, and that is going to turn into the ATP. We use lipids, so fat and the lipid are very similar. We use lipids for more than just energy, though. All right, so again, people are very sort of health conscious and afraid of fats, even though maybe they shouldn't be quite so much as long as they're not overweight. Um, and eating way too much of it, um, but our body does need some fat. So steroid hormones like testosterone, estrogen, they are all lipid based. Um, also, all the cell membranes in our body also have a bilayer lipid membrane. 
So also all the cell membranes in our body have a bilayer lipid membrane, so we do need some lipids or some fats in order to maintain normal integrity of our body and our systems. So protein um, is essentially a bunch of amino acids bound by nitrogen, and again there's 4.1 kcals worth of energy per gram of protein. However, it should note that our body prefers not to use protein as an energy source, and it's generally best if it doesn't. Right? So when we use protein as an energy source, our storage form of protein is essentially things like muscle and organ tissue, um, so those lean tissues. Uh, so for liberating proteins in order to make energy we're essentially sucking it out of things like muscle uh, so we're shrinking our muscles in the process so it's not something our bodies or we generally want to do all right so if we though consume too much protein just like carbohydrates it's going to turn into fat through lipogenesis so if we consume too much of any calorie consume uh, calorie containing substance we are going to produce fat. The reverse of that is protein catabolism. So we can break down proteins, liberating out the amino acids and the nitrogen, um, which is essentially just uh, discarded for the most part. Um, and with those amino acids, if we need to, we can produce acetyl-CoA, which will go into the Krebs cycle, which we'll talk about later, and produce energy. Um, so again though, remember the body prefers not to use protein as its energy source and it's best that it does not. So our bodies also have the ability to produce carbohydrates from fats, from proteins, or from other things um, that our body breaks, uh, breaks down and produces like lactic acid. And that is something that that process is called gluconeogenesis. All right, so essentially you're taking amino acids, glycerols that are pulled out of uh, fat and triglycerides, uh, lactic acid, and other things, and you are going through gluconeogenesis and pre creating glucose. All right, so when our body doesn't have much, enough glucose around, it can use other things in order to make glucose, um, which is again what will eventually happen in some sort of low carbohydrate diet as our body will ramp up its gluconeogenesis. And this generally happens in the liver. Um, it can happen in other tissues, but the liver is the most active site for gluconeogenesis. It talks about all the major energy um, sources as far as it, that's in our food. Um, one that wasn't mentioned is alcohol. So alcohol does have energy in it but again it's not something that should be in a typical diet at least not in high enough uh, volumes to be important but we have carbohydrates and fat as our two primary energy sources that our body uses um, proteins not listed on this slide because again our body tries not to use protein for energy um, but we have um, all the different places where these tend to be in highest quantity so we're looking at carbohydrates here um, in the fluids of the body. So think of things like the blood, which has blood glucose in it. Very little carbohydrate is there, so very little energy in kilocalories. The liver, a little bit more carbohydrate stored there. Again, in the liver, it's stored as glycogen. Um, so about 450 or so uh, uh, kilocalories of energy in uh, glycogen is stored in the liver in a typical individual. So this is a sort of a lean, healthy, young male type of person. All right, so the muscle, though, has a lot more storage uh, capacity for glycogen. Um, so it does store quite a bit of glycogen, but we can still burn through all of this. It's definitely possible. Looking at fat now, uh, the muscle stores about 1,500 or so kilocalories of fat, but we have a ton of fat stored subcutaneously in, in the visceral. So in other words, between the organs deep inside the body. All right, so around 73,000 calories worth of fat is stored in our adipose tissue. All right, so compare that to our muscle carbohydrates of 2,000 or so calories. There's a lot more calories in our adipose tissue. All right, so if we compare, again, the sources of all carbohydrates versus the sources of all fats, the carbohydrates come up to around 2,500 kilocalories. The fats come up to around 75,000 kilocalories. So far, far more calories in fats. Um, so you can see that I actually had to break the axis here because there's no way you'd be able to see these smaller bars while having the fats displayed accurately. All right, so that's probably a nice place to stop right now. Um, so that was an overview of bioenergetics. We're going to get into more of the nitty gritty and how the different processes work in the next video. So please come back and watch that.